welcome to Night Sky News for July 2021 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the series where we chat about everything to look out for in the night sky in the coming months and we recap all of the space news stories that have happened in the past month. There's chapters if you want to skip ahead to any specific news story and any scientific papers I mentioned will also be linked in the video description down below. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. So from the 23rd to the 25th of July, which is this weekend, Friday to Sunday, if you're watching right after I posted this on a Thursday, this is going to be the ideal time to spot Jupiter and Saturn. And that's because the full moon is essentially going to be a great big bright beacon leading you right to them. And because it's a full moon, it's going to be quite close to the planets in the sky. It means that these will be visible essentially from sunset to sunrise, the entire night all weekend. So hopefully lots of opportunity for a clear spell at some point to be able to spot this if we keep our fingers crossed. You've got a really big window of time. So on the night of Friday the 23rd, the moon is going to be closest to Saturn. Then on the 24th, it's going to be in the middle of the two planets, which is also when the moon will be officially full as well. And then on the 25th and also the 26th, it's going to be closest to Jupiter. Now, since the full moon is so bright, essentially what's going to happen is that it's going to wash out a lot of the stars in its immediate vicinity, which means the only things that you should be able to see near the full moon are the bright point sources of light that are Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is the much brighter of the two. It's much bigger. It's also close to the sun as well. So it appears a lot brighter in the sky. That's on the left hand side. And Saturn will be the fainter thing. So maybe a little bit more difficult to spot since the full moon is so bright, but look out for its characteristic sort of yellowish hue. And because the full moon is so close to them, it should hopefully make picking these two things out a lot easier, especially if you're a newbie and you're not necessarily sure what you're looking for. The second reason why around about now is a really good time to look for Jupiter and Saturn in the sky is because they're approaching what we call opposition. This is when a planet is in the completely opposite direction from the sun in the sky. Essentially like Earth is passing between Jupiter and Saturn and the sun right now. Essentially right, they're like perfectly lit for us to be able to see them right now. Their good side is well lit. So essentially Saturn will be at opposition on the 2nd of August and Jupiter will be at opposition on the 19th of August. But you know, the couple of weeks around that, they're still gonna be incredibly bright on the sky, brighter than normal, which makes them much easier to spot. So if you can use the full moon trick this weekend to pick them out on the sky so that later on for the rest of the summer, you know, you know what you're looking for and you'll know that when you spot them in the sky, that's what uh, they are, that's Jupiter and Saturn. And you can look at them closer to opposition and enjoy them when they're at their peak brightness. Next up, the peak of the Perseids meteor shower is from the 12th to the 13th of August. Now this is the meteor shower that I get excited for every single year. It's the one that I think is worth heading outside, packing up a midnight picnic, braving the cold, and lying down on the grass and seeing how many meteors you can spot. Because usually in past years, the number of meteors per hour has been something like 60. That's like a meteor a minute. And it is known to have gotten up to about 150 meteors an hour at its peak as well. Now you won't necessarily see that many meteors because you know some of them will be a lot fainter so you won't be able to spot them with the naked eye. Uh, some of them will be much much brighter and you will definitely spot those. And some of them you know will streak off over a different part of sky that perhaps you weren't looking in as you were looking up at the sky. So which direction should you look in to make sure you see the maximum amount of meteors? Well all those meteors are going to look like they're streaming away from the constellation of Perseus. And that's because a comet called Swift Tuttle has just left a cloud of debris on its orbit around the sun. And the Earth is going to pass through that cloud of debris on its way around the sun. And so all the meteors will look like they're coming from that patch of sky where the cloud of debris is. So because they're all streaking away from that patch of sky, you essentially have to look anywhere but the constellation of Perseus. So if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you can find Perseus in the Northeast just below the famous W shape of Cassiopeia. So essentially facing south is the best thing to do. 
You'll probably know if you have like a south facing garden or a south facing window in your house, you know, be the brightest room in your house if it's south facing. So essentially look in that direction, look in the direction you would usually look in if you were gonna sort of sunbathe in your garden, you should be fine. If you can't figure it out, no worries, just lie flat on the grass and look up and you should see some meteors streaking overhead. If you're in the Southern hemisphere, not to worry, you won't actually be able to see the constellation of Perseus because it isn't visible to you because it's only a Northern hemisphere constellation. But essentially what that means is you just need to look north to see the meteors sort of streaking over the horizon towards you. And again, you should know if you have a north facing garden, if you're in the southern hemisphere, that always baffles me to think of it like that. Um, but again, if you can't figure out, just lie down flat, look up and you should see the meteors streaking overhead. Now, the Perseid meteors are known for being really bright. So even if you've not got a particularly dark sky, perhaps you're in the city suburbs, you'll still be able to spot them. But if you can get away from light pollution to a dark sky, you'll be able to see the bright and the faint. There'll be lots more meteors per hour for you to catch. As I said, the peak is around about from the 12th to the 13th of August, but you know, a week either side of that, you're gonna get a great show of these meteors, especially because on the 8th of August is the new moon, right? So there'll be absolutely no moon all night. So a very, very dark sky. When we get to the peak on the 12th or the 13th, there'll be a toenail moon. So you might wanna look out for that and then go meteor spotting as well. What I'm trying to say is essentially, you've got a really large window of time to spot these. So you can plan within those two weeks or so, you know, figure out when is maybe your warmest, clearest night that you can, you know, maybe fancy staying up past midnight, popping a blanket down outside and, you know, just spending an hour or so with friends and family, just, you know, trying to spot some meteors. That would be a great thing to do. Also, I know that a lot of people tend to go on a holiday around you know the first couple of weeks of August as well so if where you're staying has some you know sunbeds that people sunbathe on also great for star bathing as well right they're great for lying down looking up you're not gonna get a crick in your neck or anything like that um, so if you can do that while you're on holiday cocktail in hand I fully endorse that <laughs> All right, that's enough of looking up at the wonders of the night sky. Let's come back down to earth and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. All right, always start with the bad news, right? And the bad news this month is that the Hubble Space Telescope has been out of action for about five to six weeks now, not taking any astronomical observations. So back on the 13th of June, the main computer on board, which controls, you know, all of the instruments and the scientific detectors, glitch and essentially went into a safe mode and shut everything down. It's obviously a big surprise to everyone on the ground, which cued essentially this mass scramble for all of the people at Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore that manage the telescope to try and figure out what went wrong and what was going on. Now, the first thing they tried to do was um, reboot the backup computer, but that failed with the same error. It glitched and shut everything back down again into safe mode. That was a good thing though, because it meant that it wasn't the actual computer, the main computer that was having a problem, it was something else. Which without the space shuttle, we can no longer get to the Hubble Space Telescope to service, to replace the computer, for example, if it actually had been a hardware error with the computer. Now they eventually managed to trace the error back to something called the power control unit or the PCU. This essentially makes sure that there's a steady five volts of electricity always being flowed to that main computer so that it can operate. Which is the same kind of power that your phone needs as well, right? It draws six volts when it's charging, which is kind of mind blowing to think the Hubble Space Telescope and your phone are running off the same kind of power. Now there's a secondary circuit on this power control unit, this PCU, and its job is essentially to trip if anything goes wrong with that power supply. So if it drops below five volts or if it surges above five volts as well, it will trip and tell the computer uh, shut down, go into safe mode and cut off the power supply. So that's what the team at Space Telescope think has happened here. Either the voltage is too high or this secondary circuit is just stuck in this trip mode and can't get out of it. So the first thing they tried to do was to reboot this power control unit, to see if they could get it back online and working again and delivering a, a steady power supply. Hello IT, have you tried turning it off and on again? But unfortunately that failed. So 
The next plan is to try and boot up the backup power control unit instead and see if they can get things back up and running again and observing the sky. Now they were given the all clear to start that procedure yesterday as I'm filming this, which was the Thursday the 15th of July. Today is now Friday the 16th of July and there has been no updates as of yet about whether that has been successful. It should take a couple of days to go through all the procedure and the steps to do that. So we won't know for a while. So I guess we just hope that editing Becky has some good news for us. It's good news. Literally the next day on Saturday the 17th of July, uh, NASA announced that they had gotten the Hubble Space Telescope back online. And it's also now taking beautiful images again. Look at these ones. These are actually for my colleague, uh, Julianne Dalcanton at the University of Washington, who's also interested in galaxies like I am. So it's not only wonderful to see Hubble back, but it's also wonderful to see, oh, just the most gorgeous pictures of galaxies as well. I really hope that, that was good news because I um, tell you, I'm not prepared for the day that Hubble is no longer operating. So I'm really hoping that, that was good news. Anyway, moving on, the big news in terms of space exploration anyway this month was that Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic and Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin became the first space tourists. I watched the live streams of both flights, like I'm sure a lot of you did too. And yes, okay, space history has been made. There's also been a lot of controversy surrounding these flights as well. So I thought we'd just cover, you know, a few of those here. The first controversy, or I guess the first question was just, did they even go to space? So Virgin Galactic flies just above 80 kilometers in altitude. Blue Origin flies just above 100 kilometers in altitude. Now 100 kilometers is something that's called the Kármán line or the von Kármán line after Theodor von Kármán, who was a Hungarian aerospace engineer. He essentially considered the different forces that would be acting upon any craft in flight. And he worked out that below about 90 kilometers or so, the dominant force on any craft is lift, right? Aerodynamical lift from the fact that you have a dense atmosphere that can exert an air pressure. And that's essentially the force that's keeping that craft moving. You get above 90 kilometers though, and lift becomes absolutely negligible, right? It is not having any effect on that craft at all. And the main force acting upon that craft is essentially inertia. The fact that it's already moving, so it's going to continue moving because there's no friction or drag to slow it down. And so this is where internationally people have agreed that there is this line dividing aeronautics, i.e. flight, and astronautics, i.e. space flight. So people tend to consider this von Kármán line as a line that can define the edge of space, but it's an arbitrary line, right? You can't actually define the edge of space because Earth's atmosphere essentially just gets gradually less dense the higher in altitude you go. You know, we've got all these different names for sections of different densities of the atmosphere as well. And you can see the Kármán line falls somewhere in the thermosphere, but the exosphere goes all the way out to tens of thousands of kilometers above the Earth's surface. This is where molecules are still trapped by the Earth's gravity, but it's so under dense that those molecules would probably never even encounter another molecule in their life. It's what we call collisionless, right? There'll be none of those interactions that you see in gases and fluids that are at much higher densities. You can see even the International Space Station at 400 kilometers altitude orbit falls within the Earth's atmosphere, right? But the astronauts experience low gravity. You can see the curve of the Earth from the International Space Station. The sky looks black because you've got rid of the effects of our thick atmosphere at the surface, which makes the sky look blue. So the ISS is clearly in space. And by the same reasoning, although Virgin Galactic only went to 80 kilometers altitude, which was below the Kármán line, and Blue Origin went 100 kilometers altitude, which was above the Kármán line, they both flights experienced low gravity, they saw the sky as black, not as blue, and they could see the curve of the Earth. So for me, Yes, they clearly both went to space. The other controversy that surrounds these flights that's been discussed a lot on social media recently um, is just the sheer eye-watering amount of money that it costs to make this happen. And yeah, okay, you know, they're both billionaires and it's private money, it's their own money, they can decide how they would choose to spend it. We perhaps hope that they choose to spend it on something that would benefit the many, and not just the few, you know, something like solving global hunger or climate change, for example. But we can 
put a little bit of an optimistic spin on this, at least just to keep us from screaming into a pillow. <laughs> So firstly, we can look to history for an example. So when satellite technology moved from the realms of government space agencies and became private industry, society eventually massively benefited from that. So now we have satellites for communications, for weather forecasting and earth monitoring and GPS as well. So perhaps down the line, we might eventually benefit from the privatization of space flight or space tourism. You know, we can't call that yet of what might happen kind of an optimistic way of looking at things. And secondly, astronauts often describe the feeling that they get when they see Earth as a whole, you know, with no borders and they see it hanging there in space looking very, very fragile. And they describe this perspective shift that they have and just this urge to protect planet Earth. So if the incredibly wealthy people that can actually afford these space tourism flights have that same perspective shift and that need to protect Earth as a whole, then these are the people that are actually gonna have the money and therefore also the influence and power to enact change and social change. Again, it's an optimistic way of looking at it. I guess one can only hope. All right, let's chat some proper astrophysics now. And I wanna start with this paper I spotted from the Kepler Space Telescope team, who went looking for rogue planets or free floating planets. These are literally planets that are not orbiting a star in the way that, you know, Earth orbits the sun. They are just roaming freely around interstellar space. Cause you know, newly forming star systems are a very chaotic place. And so if two planets or two asteroids or just two bodies that are orbiting a newly formed star interact with each other within that chaos, what can happen is that one of them essentially gets slingshotted out into interstellar space. Now the problem with these rogue planets, free floating planets, is the fact that they are nowhere near a star to light them up so that we can see them, or they're nowhere near enough a star to actually have an influence on that star so that we can infer that they're there. For example, the way that Kepler found the thousands of planets that it did was by looking for dips in the brightness of the stars that it was observing as a planet essentially passed in front very close to its star and would be able to block a significant chunk of that star's light so we could actually detect that dip in brightness. Now these free floating planets are nowhere near enough to stars to be able to block a significant chunk of the light that we would actually notice a dip in the brightness. Instead, if they were to pass in front of a very distant background star, you know, just like a chance alignment from our perspective here on Earth, then actually what would happen is these planets would act as a lens, a gravitational lens that would actually very, very briefly brighten the star that it passed in front of. This is something we call microlensing. Now that's what this study went looking for in this massive archive of Kepler data on the brightnesses of stars. This is almost like a data science paper, right? It's like data mining. And they ended up finding 22 of these brief brightening events that had also been spotted by surveys that had been specifically designed to look out for them. So that was good because Kepler wasn't designed to actually do this. It was good that they were spotting things that other surveys had, but also they found five brand new ones that had never been spotted before. And just to give you an idea of how much work actually went into getting this information out of the huge data archives from Kepler, here is the flowchart with all the steps you need to do it. So you can tell it's very careful science. Here's the five that they found. You can see there's that really brief brightening. That shape is actually very characteristic of a gravitational lens, this micro lensing event. And you can see there's even two peaks for the candidate number five, suggesting it's actually a binary star that got lensed. So this is really promising. As I said, Kepler wasn't designed for this. So the fact they've actually been able to pull this out is astonishing. And it's actually really promising for future space missions that are planned as well. Things like Euclid and the Roman telescope as well that are gonna be searching for these things. It means they're gonna have half a chance of actually spotting them. And that is good because the more we spot, then the better statistics we have and we can actually put numbers on the amount of free floating planets that actually are in our Milky Way. These things that have been hidden and unseen for so long. All right, free floating planets are cool, but they are not brand new type of supernova cool. You know, it's not every month that there's a brand new type of astronomical object discovered. And not only that, could also help crack a thousand year old mystery surrounding the Crab Nebula as well. 
So there are two main types of supernova roughly and I'm going to start with type 2 rather than type 1 because type 2 is the classic thing you think of when you think of supernova and that is a massive star at least 10 times heavier than the sun or more massive runs out of fuel at the end of its life and essentially gravity starts to crush it inwards and all of the outer layers of the star rebound off the inner core of the star and get thrown out in this huge big essentially like explosion that we call a supernova and essentially what's left behind in the very center in that core is either a neutron star or if the star is heavy enough a black hole. A type 1 supernova is all to do with white dwarfs. Now you get white dwarfs when a star like the sun dies. So it's not very massive, the sun. So essentially when it runs out of fuel, it will swell up to a red giant and essentially those outer layers will just fizzle off into space and it'll leave a white dwarf behind in its core. If the white dwarf is in a binary star, it can actually start pulling material off the other star and start growing in mass. And it'll reach a point where it's taken in so much material that gravity is so strong that it starts to collapse in on itself again and you get runaway nuclear fusion and a, this huge burst of energy in a supernova that can be seen billions of light years away. Now it's only stars up to about eight times heavier than the sun that will leave behind one of these white dwarfs that has the potential to, to do this kind of supernova, this type one supernova. But it's only stars that are 10 times heavier than the sun that will go type two supernova. So people have always wondered, well, what happens to the stars that are between eight to 10 times the mass of the sun. Well, back in 1980, a group of astronomers predicted a third type of supernova, type three, which they called electron capture. Essentially what they said would happen with these eight to 10 times the mass of the sun stars is that they'd be heavy enough to leave behind a core that would be able to gravitationally collapse and force the electrons and protons that have previously been in a plasma state, right, where the electrons were free to roam around, they weren't bound to the protons in atoms. That gravitational collapse would force that to happen. They would force the electrons into orbits around protons, forcing atoms to be made, and that would cause this implosion and a huge burst of energy outwards that we'd call a supernova. Now they predicted that these supernova would look very different to any other kind of supernova, especially because they would have a different chemical makeup from the others as well. And they came up with like six defining features of one of these supernova to look out for. Problem is, we've never spotted anything like that since 1980, except for the fact that there was the Crab Nebula could maybe have been a promising candidate. So the Crab Nebula is thought to be the remnant of a supernova that flared up in 1054 that was recorded by Chinese, Japanese, and Arabian astronomers at the time. Now the records we have suggest that it could actually have been seen during the day for two weeks after the supernova went off. So it outshone the sun for two whole weeks that we could still see it in the sky. And then you could see it at nighttime as well for a good two years after the supernova with the naked eye, which is incredible that it would have been such a dominant feature in the sky for that long. And when we look at the chemical makeup of the Crab Nebula now, there's some hints that it may have come from one of these electron capture supernova if the models of those electron capture supernovas are right. But obviously we've never found a supernova or observed a supernova going off that looked like one of these electron capture supernova, you know, that had all of these six characteristics that they think one of these should have. So it's been an interesting hypothesis for a while, but that's really all it was. But this month, a study has come out led by Hiramatsu and collaborators who announced the discovery of a supernova that's been dubbed 2018ZD, which was first spotted way back in March 2018, and they've been meticulously observing it ever since. Now they found it in the outskirts of a nearby galaxy called NGC 2146, which was very lucky because it meant, because it was so close by, it had been observed before with the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can actually see the star that was there before the supernova went off. And because it was spotted so quickly, they got observations right after the supernova and they've been tracking it so, so closely, looking at its chemical makeup, and have found that the supernova 2018ZD has the six characteristics of electron capture supernova that were predicted way back in 1980. 
So it's looking very likely that this third type of supernova actually exists. You know, the, the observations that we have, they don't fit any of the type two or the type one models for supernova that we have. So it's very, very likely. And it's also makes it more likely that the Crab Nebula could have been one of these electron capture supernova as well. Of course, it would be better if we had a handful of these candidate electron supernova events rather than just one of them, you know, we can get better statistics, we can be sure about whether this actually does exist, we can sort of correlate them and say, okay, these do have these shared properties in the same way that these type 2 supernova and the type 1 supernova have shared properties. But, you know, to find more of them, we're just going to have to keep our eyes on the sky. Okay, and now for some cosmology. Cosmology is essentially a branch of astrophysics that's solely focused on the evolution and the properties of the universe as a whole, right? It's big picture stuff. It's how we went from Big Bang to, to what we see today. And they've got a little bit of a crisis on their hands, cosmologists, because the two different methods they use to get the rate that the universe is expanding, which also if you invert that number and sort of like, you know, like rewind time, you can get at like the age of the universe as well. Two main methods they use to get at that number are giving different answers. Now, I've made some videos in the past on this, which I'll link in the cards up here and also in the video description down below if you want a little bit more background detail. But essentially, there's two ways that we can get this number of the expansion rate of the universe. The first thing we can use is the cosmic microwave background, right? This echo of radiation for the Big Bang. And essentially, we fit a model of the universe to that cosmic microwave background. We run that model forward and see, well, what rate would the universe have to expand at to give us the universe that we see today? Today. So that's more of an indirect way of getting at the rate of expansion of the universe, like it's inferred from a model. We can actually get that expansion rate much more directly by actually measuring it. We work out the distances to galaxies, we measure how fast they're moving away from us, and then with those two values you can essentially get at the rate of expansion. But those two methods have given us numbers that never matched. That wasn't that big of an issue when our measurements weren't that precise, but now they're getting much more precise and they don't agree with in errors anymore. So that either means that there is a problem with our best model of the universe, which would be great because it would mean we'd learn new physics, or there's a problem with some of the measurements that we're making, or there's a bias in some of the data that we're not aware of, or it's something else that we've not thought of entirely. And this is why it's considered such a, a big crisis for cosmologists to actually sort out. And this month, a paper by Wendy Freeman has come out, essentially picking one of those reasons, saying it's actually due to the measurements that we're making. Now, Freeman is a giant in cosmology, right? She led a team in 2001 who used the Hubble Space Telescope to measure the rate of expansion five different ways and measured it to an accuracy of 10% for the very first time, and it resolved this long-standing debate on what the value was that could be traced all the way back to Hubble in the 1920s. So when I saw this paper appear on the astronomy archive of data papers that we have this month, I clicked on it so fast. I was just like, Wendy Friedman will save us all. And essentially what she says in this paper is that we don't have to worry about this tension, this crisis. It will go away on its own, essentially. It's going to dissipate slowly over time as the next generation of telescopes come online and give us better, more accurate data. Specifically, more accurate data so that we can get a much better calibration for distances, the distances to galaxies that we need to do this like absolute measurement of the rate of expansion. So the main way that's actually done is with supernova, the type one supernova that I was talking about before, these white dwarfs, they always go supernova at the exact same brightness. So wherever you spot them in the universe, from the brightness that they appear to be, you know how far away they are. It's what you do when you cross a road at night, right? You look left and right and you can see the how bright car's headlights are and knowing how bright a car's headlight is when it's really close to you, you can make some judgment on how far away that car is and if it's safe to cross the road. The problem with the supernova method is that we don't know what that actual brightness is that they always go off with. You know, we don't have that calibration like you have with car's headlights of knowing how bright they are if they're right next to you compared to far away. You know, thankfully for us, no type one supernova has ever gone off really, really close to Earth. I think we are all grateful for that. 
So what we do is we use another measure of distance that we can do very close by, you know, in the Milky Way and its sort of surrounding neighbors that we can use as sort of like a ladder to then get the distances, the supernova that we can see out much, much further in incredibly distant galaxies because they're so bright. Now, again, there's two main ways of doing this in sort of our local Milky Way region. And that is either with Cepheid variables or with the tip of the red giant branch. Now, Cepheid variables is the classic way of doing this. Henrietta Leavitt discovered in 1908 that there was a relationship between how fast Cepheid variables pulsed and how bright they were. So if you could measure the period that they pulsed at, you know how bright they should be and you can get the distance from how bright they appear. Now, the other way is using this tip of the red giant branch. And some of you might be familiar with this very famous diagram called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of stars. It essentially shows how cooler stars are fainter and hotter stars are much brighter, at least when they're going through, you know, normal hydrogen burning nuclear fusion that's sort of like the majority of their lives. When they run out of that hydrogen fuel though, they swell to this red giant size and they eventually reach a point where the pressure and temperature mean that helium burning, helium nuclear fusion kicks in uh, to make carbon. At this point, the temperature of the star rockets, but it happens at a very specific brightness. You can see that here in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, right? So if you can pick out stars on that tip of the red giant branch at that specific brightness and temperature, then you can tell from how bright they appear how distant they are. And that's our first step along this distance ladder, right? We can do this with very nearby galaxies, but that's it. And it gets us the distance to them so that when we observe one of these type 1a supernovas in those galaxies, then we know how far that is. And that's our calibration to be like, okay, we can then use that calibration for even more distant type one supernovas. So what Friedman showed in this paper was that if you use the Gaia survey data, which is a telescope that's surveying the positions and brightness of over a billion stars in the Milky Way, you can use that to work out where this tip of the red giant branch is, get this distance calibration again, and then apply that distance calibration to all of the supernova data that's been collected in the past, sort of like reanalyze it with this new calibration and then work out again what the rate of expansion of the universe is. And if you do that, you find a value which actually agrees with the value inferred from the cosmic microwave background. That's the first time ever that a local measurement has agreed with these measurements from the cosmic microwave background. So this is a big deal, right? It suggests that there never really was this tension. There was no new physics for us to figure out, which I guess is a little bit of a shame. New physics would have been fun. But it just means that perhaps our measurements that we were taking in the local universe were the problem, and especially these distance calibrations, which is not surprising because we always knew that our distances were very uncertain anyway. But it's nice to actually be able to show that. Although weirdly, if you take the same guy survey data and look at the Cepheid variables and work out with that more accurate data what the um, distance calibration would be and apply that to the supernova, you still get a value that doesn't agree with the cosmic microwave background or this value that's worked out with the tip of the red giant branch. So that could suggest that there's perhaps some issue with our understanding of Cepheid variables and maybe the physics behind them as well. Perhaps it's not as simple as the luminosity being proportional to the period. Perhaps there's something else in there that we're missing, which I think is really interesting there. At least there might be some new physics there anyway. Again, larger surveys of the sky with more accurate measurements of things like brightness are really going to help with these distance calibrations. So for example, Gaia, it's not done yet. You know, there's still more data releases to come as it continues and finishes up its survey of over a billion stars in the Milky Way. But then also the James Webb Space Telescope is going to help as well. Another thing on the James Webb Space Telescope's shoulders, you know, the crisis in cosmology is now resting there as well as if there wasn't already enough riding on it. But it's, you know, very promising, I think, thinking about the future of, of astrophysics and the future of cosmology when we look at this. You know, I think we're one step closer to perhaps resolving this crisis in cosmology, and maybe it won't even be sort of a resolving, it'll just sort of be like a, a fizzling out <laughs> of the crisis in cosmology.
All right, that's it for Night Sky News for this month. If you want more like up-to-date reactions from me on space news as it happens, you can follow me over on social media. And also on social media, you should send me any images or pictures you take of the night sky this month. I always love to see them. My special favorite thing is waking up one random morning in the month and being like, why have I got so many notifications? Like, what on earth's happened overnight? And I realized, oh, a toenail moon. There's just so many of you sent me your beautiful images of toenail moons. I really do love that morning. It's a, it's a great one to wake up to. Next week I'm going to be at the National Astronomy Meeting, or the virtual meeting that's being held virtually at the University of Bath for the Royal Astronomical Society and I'm actually going to be presenting my own research, the, my most recent findings on how supermassive black holes grow. I've just submitted a, a research paper of my own and so I'm going to also be giving a talk to all of my colleagues as well about what I found and I'm going to be vlogging the whole thing as well just to bring you guys along for the ride so you know you understand what I found recently in my own research but also what, what we all get up to at these uh, uh, virtual meetings and conferences that we're having. So look out for that next week. But until then, happy stargazing, everybody. Just have my COVID drop, my second one look. I got a little plaster because I was bleeding. So we're just, just going to leave that on there. Well, we out. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> and they were given the go ahead to do that yesterday, which was the third, the third, blah, 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 the Thursday. <laughs> Scream like a <laughs> like every time I scream, I think I sound stupid. <laughs> Try one more time. <sighs> Just don't one of those is usable. All right, free floating planets are free floating. <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen at some point. So the crab neminent. So the neminent. So the crab neminent, <laughs> nebula and remnant mixed together. It does look like it could have come from one of these electron capture super, supermarkets. I was about to say supermarkets. Capture supermarkets, oh God. Cosmology is a branch of astrophysics that focuses slowly, slowly? They focus very slowly on the Big Bang. Our distance measurements and our distance collaboration, which, collaboration? Calibration. It was literally just a problem with our measurements and our distance collaborations. Collaborations, they did it again! <laughs> collaborations! Uh.